And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a newcomer to the temple. He is the head of, of Dark Vale Studios. And the and the creative director of the upcoming Dark Vale role playing game, I like that. It, I like that it stays consistent. The one, the one and only, the man best no, the man best known as T or T Julian Bell, whichever you prefer. How are you doing tonight, man? I'm doing great. Thanks so much for having me on. And thank you for coming on. Um, it it's a bit of a tradition to open with the humble beginnings, in a sense. So, with that in mind, I'd like I'd like you to walk me through your first introduction to role playing games and what was it that made it stick. First introduction and what made it stick. So, I've told uh, variations of the story, so I'll try to I'll try to be unique and, and find elements that I didn't really uh, mention previously. But mm -hmm. uh, I always wanted to play tabletop role playing games as far back as probably eight, nine, ten years old. Um, not even realizing what they truly were, you know, seeing a seeing a tattered version of a AD and D book on a uh, shelf of a relative or at a friend's house on a sleepover and asking what that is and th them being very uh, very cagey about revealing too much, almost almost worried that I, um, they might be outed for um, you know for for their hobby. And as time went on, um, this is early '90s, uh, late '80s, early '90s. Mm -hmm. Um, as the 90s progressed, I started to learn more and more about tabletop role-playing games and about Dungeons and & Dragons, and there were groups in my high school that played regularly, mm -hmm. but none of them wanted me to play. They just they were, they were afraid to, to have me join, and I'm not sure entirely if it was because they were worried about possibly being outed for being D&D &D players or for being bullied for being D&D &D players. Um, I was bullied for all sorts of things. Uh, one of them was not playing D&D. &D. Um, I can say that, but I think that that was a fear back in, in that time. And it was very justified. Um, it was a very close knit group and they loved their hobby. And I guarantee adding other people to that hobby could have, could have potentially um, upset that dynamic. So I'm, I'm, I'm not glad that they kept me out. I wish I had been playing uh, much earlier in my uh, in my days, but um, I understand um, how coveted it is and how how romanced it is to to have this um, incredible group that you don't want to um, add any other elements to that could upset it. Yeah. So my initial um, involvement wasn't until college of my freshman year, mm -hmm. it's around uh, the year two thousand. And I had a roommate that played Dungeons and Dragons um, off campus, and uh, he, within the first week, was begging me to come play uh, Dungeons and Dragons. It, at that time, I think it was 3.0 um, that they were playing. It had just come out. Hey, you really should come play this. I, I know you'd be into it. I know that you're a theater major, and that's, you know I, I was a, a technical design and actor dual degree theater major in college. And so they knew I could do improv, and they knew I was into characters and storytelling, and um, just begged and begged and begged. Of course, I was more interested in going out and meeting, you know, college girls and 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 hanging out with people late at night. And I just wasn't interested at the time to go play D and D game. But finally, after about a month or so, um, I broke down and said, "Okay, fine, I'll go play this game." And so I went, and uh, sure enough, off campus, the most stereotypical. D D hobbyist home that you could possibly walk into um even you know romancing it in my memories i don't think i could do it justice there was that staleness to the air where the dust had settled just right on the bookshelf and there was the the spaces that you could see the games that were played more than others um where they had been removed and the other dust had remained untouched no one had dusted it or cleaned it um the the sofas that wrapped around in a perfect C around this giant uh, coffee table that was just high enough to play off of. Mm -hmm. um, they were they were perfectly indented with these um, these spots where someone had been seated for hours on end and just kind of indented this cushion uh, butt print um, on on that chair or on that sofa where you know people have been playing for hours and hours and hours for years. The the owner of the house was this uh, gentleman 
in his, uh, I want to say 50s at the time. He's probably 75, 80 now. Um, or right, 70 now, probably 70. Um, mm -hmm. But he, he owned the house and played D&D &D with all these other college kids. And there was a couple uh, people that lived in the house with him, um, roommates, and they were all D&D &D gamers as well. And, and gamers of other games, Traveler, and um, at that time, uh, I think Vampire, they played every now and then, a few other old school games. And so I came into this house, and my first experience was in a group of about seven or eight. And it was just, that's a lot of players for me now. Um, back then, I had no idea what I was doing. So I was helped into making a character. Of course, I had to go over first a previous day and create the character and be taught the rules. And then the following day was the actual game. So it already felt like I was getting into a lot. And um, I, I was really kind of, oh, man, really, I got to do this extra work, prepare for it. Then I got to go. And I'll be honest, there was a lot of sitting around and just watching others play mm -hmm. and listening to others play. And I, of course, was given a fighter. You're not allowed to play anything but a fighter. You're brand new. Um, but I wanted to play a fighter that was doing everything. I wanted to be that fighter that could... Um, do thief stuff. Apparently fighters are not good at any thief stuff. Or um, why can't I do magic? Why can't I use that thing? Why can't I ride this horse? <laughs> um, everything I wanted to do was always a, nope, you can't do that. You got to roll for it. And there was one moment where it finally clicked for me, which was, and I've, I've mentioned this in other places, but it was um, when the GM said and the goat men take a niche and i just remember that as being this like really ridiculous phrase but it was so um like metal it just felt like this great like yeah yeah the goat men take a niche like it was a cool band name um so it sticks in my mind but it, my character was walking down this dirty uh wet and slimy uh, dungeon sewer with the other characters in the group and of course they didn't care that i went first hey it's fodder this guy might never come back let's just let him go up front and so my fighter's up front and i i said so i have a bow right can i can i take the oil that i have from my inventory and and rip a piece of rag off of something and make a, like a flaming arrow and shoot it down the the long corridor here just so we can see ahead because i can't see anything it's pitch black and so there was a little discussion like, well, you're not going to be able to do that, but you can roll for it. And so I rolled a, I rolled a d20, still the same red d20. It's the only die I still have today from my original set because um, I went and bought a set before my first game because I wanted to be like everybody else and show up and feel like I had something going on. And I rolled that d20 and rolled a 20. And this is one of the first actual things I did um, that day in, in, the, in the game. And they said, wow, we'll roll it again. I rolled it, got another 20. <laughs> and so I critically succeed of you know putting this fire and, and oil on the front of my arrow and shoot it down the, the, the long haul. And that's what the GM says, and the goat men take a niche. And apparently I lit up a goat man and uh, lit him on fire and took out one of the enemy immediately in the fight. And so it was just this really great moment of like, oh, I can do that. I can actually do whatever I want in this universe. And it, it felt so real. And everyone was really excited mm -hmm. that I, this guy who had just been sitting on the sofa for the previous few hours, not really engaging with anything, all of a sudden joined role-playing. Like, that was my moment. I'm like, okay, now I'm role-playing. And uh, it was just really cool. That moment has stuck with me forever. I don't remember much of anything else in that game. Um, or any of the rest of that campaign um, beyond few little moments here and there. Um, but that stuck in my mind. It was just, you know, 20 years later, and I'm still remembering that particular feeling and moment. And, uh, you know, and there's been you know, thousands of games in between, and that one still sticks out. Mm -hmm. Now, going from... Going from... D going from D and D, which I'm get, I'm given the time frame, I'm going to guess, I'm going to guess that was A D and D second. Just ju just judging by the fact that you mentioned that that this was, um, nineties. Uh yeah, so this would have been two thousand. Um, is when I went to college. So I, I think three point had just come out. Yeah, it did. Um, yeah, it did. Um, so I think I think it was they were all still learning three as well, but they were you know many, they were probably you know, eight, nine levels in. So they'd had it for a while at that point. Oh, yeah. Um, 
it's you, usually usually I can guess which which edition I'm which edition I'm dealing with with some, with somebody based on <clears throat> the year. And it only it yeah. only gets tricky when you're dealing with um when you're dealing with first edition because there's like five different versions of it. Um, oh yeah, that's that's before my time. Um, sadly, I didn't get a chance to really dive into uh, too much uh, early early D and D days, AD and D days. But it's quite a jump going from that to the kind of system that you have for Dark Vale. And um, would it be fair of me to say that you had that um that you had jumped around from a lot from a lot of different systems, especially since it sounds like the guys who the guys who well initiated you. Certainly, certainly weren't a um, certainly weren't one system lifers. Yeah, you know there there were people in that group that were the lifers, right? They were mm-hmm. diehard. They loved um, one game and one game only, and uh, that was typically D and D, right? Oh, yeah. Um, and it was already hard enough for them to have to be adjusting to three point um, let alone. Um, Taking on those different rules, which I'm, I'm, I'm not an expert in any way of, you know, eighty any second, um, or whatever, whatever the different versions are called. Um, but I know it was already difficult, and they had adopted three point oh. So that was, you know, that was what I learned. That was that was the first game, and then three point five a few years later, um, you know, adapting some changes to the rules and, and understanding it. But yeah, when when you're starting to homebrew, which was for me was I started running my first game myself as a gm about a year and a half later after that um finally you know taking the leap and becoming a gm and i experimented with all sorts of games styles of of playing um traveler was big for me early on there's a lot of influence i think of traveler more than any other game um and what i am doing now uh shadow run is also a um inspiration i think there's a lot of versatility to shadow run and what the options are and the I love the thematic elements of the Shadowrun world, um, and I think that you can see some of that in in what I create now. But for me, when I started running games, it it wasn't so much about I love D and D. I want to stick to the D and D system. It was more about I love storytelling. Mm-hmm. And what's the best system that can tell this story the best way? And there was just certain games that just didn't work as well in a D twenty system. Um, at least for what I was, the stories that I was telling, or the the stories that the group wanted, and so I started experimenting a lot with other systems and my own homebrew versions of it, and hacking things up and rebuilding them. And it was it was very early in my uh, gaming career that I was already, um, you know, looking back, catch twenty two, I was already becoming a game designer in the very early days uh, without really even knowing it. Mm-hmm. Um. Since you mentioned Shadowrun, I have to ask you, how many pounds mm-hmm. of six siders do you have? <laughs> um, I actually have quite a few six siders, but only because um, that's what Dark Vale operates off of. But I don't have pounds of them. I have um, most of them are actually uh, like custom, exclusive Chromor dice from our Chromor game. Uh, you know, years ago we had some exclusive runs on uh, Kickstarter that we did. And I have a few of them left, and I pulled a bunch of the D6s out of those uh, out of those sets to uh, kind of build my own Dark Veil kind of custom dice that I, I play with all the time. Mm-hmm. Um, but I don't have pounds of them. I probably only have like a, a pound or two of them. Um, yeah, that's probably not that's probably not enough for a se- for a session of Shadowrun. <laughs> no, no, you need you need lots of dice for that. The amount of di- I always tell people the amount of dice you need for Shadowrun games is yes, yes. <laughs> Do you have enough? No. So, <laughs> Do you want more? Yes. Yeah, you know, kind kind of like how kind of like how you can't have enough DACA. <laughs> but that that does bring me to um, Dark Vale, which um, seem which. I don't think it would be unfair of me to say that this is very much a multi-genre um, type type of game. And uh, yeah, correct. And but what I'm curious about is how the idea kind of started out. Was it a case of you were doing a whole lot of genre hopping and you just decided to combine all of them, or was there a different path? Yeah. So Chromor um, RPG I created and released um, back in 2014 was a universe that I built more of a sandbox. Mm-hmm. So it was this 
10,000 years of, of time over a universe is history. And each time influenced the, the future time, et cetera. And there were so many great moments throughout that time period. Uh, when we came around to Dark Vale and we were trying to figure out, you know, what's the setting here for this? And ultimately, the, the setting kind of revealed itself as a reinvention of blowing up that universe and taking the best bits and saying, well, if time no longer exists, which is the setting of Dark Vale, it's the, uh, the universe is fractured. The realms, which are par parallel infinite uh, universe to our own, um, those realms, the realm of time has broken and shattered. And it's basically taken every moment of time throughout our, our history and the infinite realms of history, um, broken them all into like one, uh, one giant puzzle piece. And, or, I'm sorry, one giant puzzle throughout each period of time. So if you have all these different puzzles and you shake them all up and mix them all up, and then you just create one puzzle out of that and remove all the other pieces, you create this one new timeline. So no, there is no past, there is no future, there's just now. Mm. And it exists of all these different time periods. And that was really, once we came to that conclusion of, oh, that's a really great way to introduce different periods of time. So you have your medieval fantasy, you have your steampunk, you have your um, space era travel, you have your cosmic era travel, you have all of these different moments of time and this parallel universe that you can connect to through this dark veil that is the border of all of these different sectors and you still have your universe so you still have a planet you still have you know uh space and and uh, different planets to travel to within space but there are all these sectors that are dividing all of these different um, periods of time throughout the universe so your neighbor is no longer just your neighbor your neighbor is five thousand years ago you or your other neighbor on your opposite side might be uh, 300 years in the future. And that was the way that we could um, genre blend without feeling like we were genre blending. It's one year passed in the setting for Dark Veil vale of this event, this time event, uh, and the beginning of the Dark Veil's vale appearance. And the Dark Veil vale acts as a connection point or an infinite um, highway to all of these realms on the other universe uh, if you if you want to use like the idea of um the uh what's the the tv show on netflix the uh the underneath or the what is it uh the flip side of reality what am i trying to reference it's late <laughs> uh the the uh the under oh my goodness people people should be criticizing me for this one i don't watch um, enough netflix so i can't exactly help you there <laughs> Yeah, so um, there's the the '80s um, nostalgia show on Netflix uh, that came out a few years ago. It sounds like fourth series, um, uh, but anyway, the uh, the veil is a way to travel to all of these other places and other moments within those infinite realms. So there might be like a realm of shadow, or a realm of sorrow, or a realm of light, or um, realms of emotions or just other civilization realms that are trapped within this other universe and so you can step into this dark veil this you know thin barrier around every different sector and if you know how to travel it you can travel to these other places and basically use it like a uh, a, a transporter if you will to walk into those other places or if you fall into the veil and don't know where you're going and don't have an ability to navigate it you might get lost in another um in another realm and so it created this great way to travel between these different places very quickly and it created a forcible means for players to have to interact with it um, the universe of dark veil vale, the different factions on these different time periods have created gateways and the gateways are not like stargates that transport you somewhere else they actually just cut a hole in that veil so that you can get to that neighbor from a different time period. So they're opening up these gateways and these travel points to trade and to communicate and to interact with their neighbors. And so this is happening across this uh, the planet and across the universe now, a year since this event has occurred. And you have this different mixing of these genre time periods, but they're all from the same universe. Mm -hmm. So it was, it was just a really clever way once we figured that out to allow people to use swords, to allow people to use guns, to allow people to use steam weapons, to have giant steam robots and fantasy monsters and space creatures 
um, aliens that could be, you know, attacking all in their different places, but now interacting with each other from these different factions and these different cultures from other other times. It just it's set for a good setting, and it forced the player to have to make decisions in every moment. You know, the worst thing about playing a game is, or even running a game is, you don't know what to do next. Um, in this universe, you always have that dark veil at the border of every sector, and things can come out of it. Players can go into it. Your magic is derived from it for some characters. Mm -hmm. um, so there's always this interaction with that dark veil. And once we once we unlock that, that was the brand that we stuck to. And we said, okay, great. So as long as the dark veil is there for everything, the universe writes itself. Oh, yeah. Now, when it comes to when it comes to when it comes when it comes to this particular setup, when you've um, when you've brought this to to your te to your testing team, um, yeah. have people brought have people brought up time travel? Since I think that's something yeah. that's something that is that could end up happening. And if I'm going to be blunt, time travel storytelling is a fucking minefield. <laughs> yeah. So um, so the nice thing about this is that in Cromore, there was one page in Cromore that a lot of people stuck to that was time travel. It allowed you to pass in different times um, to go back to these different time periods. Mm -hmm. And that was um, this one page within that 352 page book that a lot of people enjoyed. And we actually had a lot of feedback. And I've, I've heard from people all the time, oh, yeah, we, we travel through time with our characters. And it's just a fun way that they played. Um, but it does cause conflicts. In Dark Veil, vale, the setting is not allowing of time travel because the time realm is broken. Time does not exist outside of this current moment. So all of these different sectors that you're traveling to, think of um, if you take the United States, you're in the States, right? Mm -hmm. um, are you, you in the U.S. or are you in Canada? Yeah, I'm, I'm okay. Just... So imagine every state in the U.S., um, all of their borders have this giant um, purplish cloud of smoke on them and this cloud of smoke travels around the entire border and it goes up to the sky and it domes out over the top and then deep into the earth it has a you know a finishing dome it surrounds you completely that's the dark veil every single state in the u.s would then have one and when you wanted to go from i live in north carolina if i wanted to go from north carolina to south carolina i would have to go to a gate to cross to that next state and South Carolina might be 500 years in the past. Mm -hmm. But if then if I go up north to Virginia, Virginia might be 1,000 years in the future. And so there are these gates and these crossings that now require documentation. Where are you going? What are you bringing with you? Different factions might control them. Or you might have a magi or a character with a spell that knows how to cut through that veil wall and create a rift or a breach that can allow your group to kind of sneak through uh, another point. And so you're not time traveling time travel is impossible in fact because time is broken and no one knows how to fix that and we we're not releasing any of that for a long time mm -hmm. so because time travel is broken you can't travel back in time but you can walk to another sector that is from a different time period mm -hmm. now with with that in mind let's i'd like to go into a bit of the mechanics now yeah it's very it's very clear that um that Sh that Shadowrun is a significant influence, especially w especially with the hit based um D D six, um, mm -hmm. success based hits yeah yeah I I just call I just call a bunch of different games have d have different names for it I just call it hits just for the sake just because I'm not yeah. paid by the syllable, yeah. <laughs> um, but I've I've got a couple qu I've got a couple questions on that I'll go with the, I'll go with the relatively easy question first before I get into the trickier one. The easy question is the fact that you you have you have it that um si if I'm not mistaken sixes explode and fives are just regular successes right yep um what prompt what prompted that particular idea since exploding exploding dice is certainly a thing in die pools but I wouldn't exactly call it widespread yeah so you know honestly. I say that Shadowrun was an influence. Shadowrun is an influence more and so that it was a game I played, you know, 15 plus years ago. Mm -hmm. And I liked some of the feeling of the way that you could play the game. It didn't necessarily, mechanically, this this game was not influenced mechanically um, by any other particular mechanics that are out there. I spent the better part of the last five or six years um, dealing with a, a neurological um 
medical problem mm -hmm. that uh, forced me to learn how to walk and talk properly again. Uh, it, it caused me to really struggle with the way that I would build sentence structure. Um, I'm a writer, and, it, and when you can't complete a thought from the beginning of the sentence to the end of the sentence, because your brain doesn't remember what it started with, um, it's really difficult to, um, to, to write and to comprehend and to be creative and, and to do anything like gaming. So I haven't gamed, you know, I have gamed in the last couple of years, but I, I didn't game for five years. And I had to walk away from Cromor and uh, race games because I was just more focused on, you know, my own health. We didn't know what was going on. Uh, luckily, we've had a better control of it. I had, uh, I've had surgery um, uh, recently last year, and I have a better understanding of, of the disability, the neurological problems that I deal with. So <clears throat> that being said, I started doing Sudoku puzzles while I was... Um, dealing with like trying to figure out ways to uh, retrain my brain and retrain my hands to write. Um, so while I was doing these, um, I was just playing around with simple numbers. And, you know, so good puzzles are just one to one to nine. It's very, very simple puzzles, simple game to just, you know, it's rote, it's, it's mechanical, and you start doing enough of them, and your brain starts to kind of rewire itself correctly. And it was that that got me motivated to, hey, I kind of want to get back into game design, I kind of want to get back into gaming because I always really love that. I can't go do Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu because um, <laughs> I'm, I'm all messed up. Um, I was doing a lot of Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, but got to the point where I had to, had to stop. And I used to do martial arts, and you can't do those things anymore, and you need to find an outlet. And so I'm a, I'm a person that's extremes. I, I jump into something, and I go full, full bore into it. Mm -hmm. So when I came back over to, to gaming as, as you know, the hobby I wanted to express myself in and and get, dive back into, I started building a board game. And that board game is very simple. And it was, um, you know, what die are available that are going to be the cheapest for the board game that are also the most easiest to associate um, with. And what is the best mechanical device for this board game? And it was a D6. And it was literally just uh, you roll the bad guy die and the good guy die um, in that board game. And it's a board game we're working on um, that'll be um, previewed next year, hopefully released next year. Um, but it's, it's very pandemic style uh, group co-op game where you and other players are trying to fight back evil. It was actually what spawned Dark Veil as, as an idea. And you're trying to um, stop evil from spreading through these gates across the planet. And you use these D6, D6 mechanic to uh, roll your die and the, and the evils die at the same time because there's no storyteller in that it's a board game and the players control the enemy of it and you roll your own fate by rolling the enemy die and your die and you add up whatever the bonuses of your character are and whatever the bonuses of that enemy character are and you have these bonuses you subtract or add and so i was already kind of there when we started moving into dark veil vale, and initially i started looking at okay well out there what could i use and then i immediately just cut that from my brain and said well i haven't been gaming for a really long time so i have a benefit right now i'm not influenced by whatever the most popular thing is today and i'll be honest i don't know a lot about the gaming community um at large i, I haven't been to a gen con in many years um the most i've gamed is dark veil vale. um board games test groups I stay pretty close to uh, our products because I don't really have time to do too much else. I played a few other games uh, with some other friends uh, in the last year or so, but not not what you would call like a, a huge hobbyist in the TTRPG space. I just I don't know what's out there. I don't know mechanics, mm -hmm. so I really broke down from the beginning of game mechanic design of saying I need um, I need something that can add a one in terms of like, like I need one point to be higher than the zero. And then I need something that can increase that again. And I need something. Can so I started playing with a bell curve of just, here's what I want to solve for. Here's the problem I want to solve for. I want to be able to walk up to something and hit it. Okay, well, if I hit it, how do I calculate what's going to add? And I, I really just went bare bones and, and, and thought about, is this dice? Is this, you know, Jenga tower? Because I knew some other people were doing Jenga towers. Is this a card-based thing? Is this a, a, a rock, paper, scissors? How, how am I going to deal with this mechanic? And I started um, playing with the idea of success-based roles, understanding that there are other games that do it, but not really knowing how they do it. 
And I'm sure there's a, a ton of games that are very similar to uh, some of what we do. Um, but once I unlocked the idea of the one on the D6, that was where it became different. So yes, to go back all the way to your question, six is an exploding die um, where it continues to re-roll. The five is also a success. Four, three, and two are nothing. So you roll a D6 with a one six chance of getting an exploding die and a two thirds chance of getting a success. And your goal is to hit target DCs that are successes. So I need two successes, I need three successes, I need five successes. Um, the one though is a burn. So what that means is when you roll a one, that die is considered burned for any subsequent rolls you have um, throughout your turn. So if you would normally have four die and you have three actions on your turn, so you roll a skill for the first action, second action, and third action. If you roll a one and you normally have four die in that skill that you're rolling three times, you're going to remove that die and move it to the side and it's now burned. Now you only get three dice for your next two turns. And so the one now becomes dangerous with that one six chance because that exploding die for that six is not only exciting because you're re-rolling it for another chance of success, but you're also re-rolling it for the chance to possibly critically fail with it and burn that die. Mm -hmm. So once we figured that out, it creates this gambler's mechanic mm -hmm. where every roll feels exciting to the player. You don't know what's going to happen. You might have one die left and you could roll three sixes or you could roll a one and all of a sudden you've critically failed. So that's where it became exciting and we realized we were onto something fun. Had no idea if it existed in the world, um, but it worked for our system. And uh, with, with other elements, we can, we can go into more of the game design, but that was where the system came to life. And it was, it was through feedback of playtesting. I mean, it took a year to get to that point where people who played a year prior in play tests, we always, we always mix it up and only do it like two or three months and then bring those people back to see the changes. There were many people that came back that said, it felt good before, mm -hmm. now it feels right. And there's one particular tester that, um, that, was, that said, it just feels clean now. It feels like you've done the work. And uh, that was where we knew we were like, okay, yeah, cool. We're, we're on the right track here. Yeah. Now, with, with that kind of thing in mind, um, now I bring up I bring up Shadowrun because it's a it's an easy it is a very easy um, parallel to what mm -hmm. to a skit to essentially any sort of skill based um, D six system. Yeah. Now there's there's there there are only um while you while you don't have as many skills as certain editions of Shadowrun, thank God. <laughs> um, one one particular issue that that I've had that um some of the more recent Shadowrun editions have tried have tried to address have tried to address especially fifth and sixth is um what I call the swim damn it um rule. Okay. The swim the swim damn it rule is ba is basically like if you look at if you look at a lot of cases in Shadowrun you're you're given okay okay you pick your meta type now. Um, now you've got, now you've got, ec you've got X amount of karma to spend on, at to spend on attributes and sk skills and advantages and disadvantages. So, go at it. Um, <laughs> and while, so while I, while I understand the defense of that, there is a lot of freedom in that setup for crazy ass builds. Um, mm -hmm. there is a, there is a double edged, there is a double edged sword with that. In this, in the sense that you can end up having analysis per Analysis um, paralysis, as the yeah. term is. Um, within d within Dark Veil, vale, um, I know that I know that it's impossible to completely curtail that, but how do you minimize the issue of analysis paralysis? Yeah, it's a it's a real issue, um, and I, I definitely am aware of that. And we have uh, we have a game designer on our team uh, named Harley that uh, he and I he and I talk about this a lot with our with our traits and. There are so many traits. So um, to give the listeners an idea of how the system works, for I'll, I'll break down really quickly the, the game mechanics in, in full here. There are only, I think, 21 or 24 skills. Um, 24. I, I, 24, thank you. I know I've said it wrong a couple times, mm -hmm. so now I'm, now I'm catching myself saying it incorrectly. Um, so there's 24 skills total. Um, Eight of those skills are, you know, four of those skills are magic related, and four of those skills are combat related, and then the rest are all common skills. 
And that's it. You don't have attributes. You do not have um, any other modifiers um, relating to another stat type thing. You do have uh, modifiers from gear, from your origin background, from the organization that you join, which I suppose you could call it a class, but I'll get into why it's not a class in a second. And those apply bonus successes to those skills. Uh, when you're rolling successes with the dice, you, you roll, I have three dice for fitness. I'm going to jump over this thing. Um, you roll them. The number of successes you get is the fitness um, target that you get of successes plus whatever bonus successes you have. And it's not plus every time you roll. It's plus at the end of the turn. So if you have three actions and you split them up and you say, I'm going to do two fitness and one um, one stealth perhaps maybe i'm going to stealth into an alley and then i'm going to do two fitness uh to try to climb a building to, to get away from the guard i've used that example a ton so sorry anybody's heard it mm -hmm. um the first roll you roll you're going to then add whatever bonus successes you have to that stealth as long as you get a natural success in one of those dice mm -hmm. and then the next two actions are your fitness actions you're going to add your bonus successes once because it's all within the same turn mm -hmm. so um, so that's the only modifier to those skills. So um, when you create a character, you have an origin background. And we have this isn't in our quick play. I know there's a quick play online for free. So check that out. If you want to go to darkvillestudio.com, you can grab it and check out um, to hear what we're talking about. Mm -hmm. There's pre-gen characters in there. The origin background is showed in those pre-gen characters. Uh, the final version of the origin background has actually been been created and uh, some of those characters have slight tweaks but they're pretty close mm -hmm. and you can see where we've broken down all the things that you get from your origin background now that helps with the analysis paralysis issue because we're delivering five paths to go down and we say are you an opportunity player are you a mystic player are you a wanderlust player control or adrenaline which one of those is going to drive this character and that's a starting point to start that player out so that they have a target lane to, li to land in that gives you a couple starter traits that are only unique to you and no one else can have them um, unless they're from that archetype. Uh, then we deliver four uh, organizations and we say, which one of these organizations from that archetype do you want to join or do you want to be a part of or previously were a part of? That's where you define your class. So your class is chosen at that moment. Mm -hmm. So we're limiting the lots of options by basically driving you down one of those lanes through what is it you want to achieve with this character. Now, of course, you can sit there and go, wow, there's 20 different organizations. I don't know which one I want to choose. Well, there's only 20, and they're all very different. So you have the option of kind of choosing whichever one you're interested in today. And as you play, you could always unlock that organization and grab it later. Um, the nice thing about organizations that we do is that each one has five traits that you get when you join. They might be passive things or they might be active traits that you use, but you get them all. It's not like you have to choose one or two. You get all of them. You join the night agent organization and you are gaining all of the traits from that night agent. That's it. You get your tier one of it. You've got them all. If you want to continue with that organization, you can do it at tier two. You get all the things there. So you really, there's no choices from the player in that way. Uh, the, the rest of the origin then takes through what uh, ancestry are you choosing, which is your race. Um, we use ancestry because it just makes more sense in the universe. Um, then you choose two origin traits. They might be things like maybe your character is immortal. That's an important thing if you want to choose certain organizations or certain elements of roleplay or particular ancestry. Or maybe you have a dark contract where you've made some sort of contract of bargains with a dark a uh, shadow demon or another demon, and you've sold some of your heroic actions, which are uh, basically like bonus actions that you can get for your character. You've sold some of your max of that. Players start with five, and now your character maybe starts with three and can't go beyond it, but you gain something else for it. So um, you choose those, then you get your education background, your wealth, your belief system, uh, lawfulness, are you lawful, chaotic, or balanced? And they're all going to give you slight little bonus successes to your skills. So we walk you through that background, which drives the player in a direction of building a character, building a building a backstory for that character. And that organization is going to drive motivation for your character so that when you get to the end of it, you can say, oh, 
this is the character I'm playing. This is how they currently exist within the universe. And this is how the universe reflects upon them because I know what organization they're from, as opposed to I'm playing a fighter. I don't know where I fit in the world, but I know I beat things with a hammer. Um, this is saying, well, you play maybe an Avalon Knight and that Avalon Knight is either uh, been uh, exiled from the Avalon order of knights. Um, and for whatever reason, they don't like the, the, the new king of, of Avala that uh, usurped the previous king that was murdered. Or maybe you are still uh, connected to that throne and there's political ramifications for that. Mm -hmm. So the choice of that organization is going to already send your character down a path and give hooks to the storyteller and give hooks to you for role playing that allows you to interact with everyone immediately. Mm -hmm. Now, with now with that in with that in mind um given 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 the given the prevalence of of ma of um of the different magical skills um there is a t there is a tendency among among some designers to give a lot of attention to the supernatural end of things to the casters essentially and a l and a little bit less to anybody who isn't a caster and Certain mm -hmm. editions of D and D are significantly popular offenders when it comes to this kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, with the, with that kind of with that kind of thing in mind, um, do you ha do you have it set up where there's still a there's still a um, a a significant action pool that um, that martial characters would be able to to utilize without having to delve into magic? Yeah. So so if you're not aware of this the system. Players all start with one in a skill die. So you can, you at least have one die that you roll for every skill. That includes magic and non-magic skills. Mm -hmm. So every skill starts at one. So anyone can do anything. Uh, that means that your character can also perform, no matter how many points of dice you put into it, you can perform Spell Thief if you're a martial character, which means you can steal magic and learn magic. Or if you're a magic character and has no points really you have just that one die in your um your tactic skill which is the martial uh, equivalent of spell thief tactics can steal tactical advantage traits on the battlefield so there are spells that you can learn whether you find a book and you you want to learn that spell in real time you roll to see if you get enough successes to learn that spell you can learn it temporarily or you can learn it permanently mm -hmm. the same thing works with tactics and this is actually feedback from players in playtesting that found this for us because they had that exact same concern. And we said, okay, well, why don't we solve this by allowing tactics to also be stolen? If that person does some sort of cool um, flying knee, I want to learn that too. Oh, well, I roll my tactics. Do I get enough successes? Hey, I just learned flying knee. Now I can do an extra trait that's going to put some sort of extra condition on my target when I do it. So yes, you, you effectively can be good at tactics and spell casting or, or one or the other and still have enough uh, content there for you. Uh, like I said, we have 20 organizations. Mm -hmm. Some of them are a mix of tactics and magic. Some of them are straight tactical. Uh, some of them are more role play heavy. And some of them are very magical heavy. Mm -hmm. And the, the key for us is that we don't want to have players think about this system as I'm going to play a wizard. We want players to think of this system as I'm a Magian from the Black Hat Magi Association and uh, Magian often tamper with illusionist magic, but guess what? I also happen to know these other cool combat things and these other spells that aren't really illusionist magic. And that makes every character specially unique because as you're playing, the storyteller is going to be introducing these enemies and monsters that have traits that they're performing that you want to steal because you want them to be yours and you're going to be acquiring this library of abilities over time and it'll either be through role play where you're, you're doing it in real time or when you get story points that's our version of experience you spend your story points for additional skill dice for your skills or to unlock another organization tier and that's how you level up every organization tier some of them will say you can also go and look and grab an extra free uh trait from the traits section, we have about um, we're we're on the path right now to have over 150 traits, and there are spell traits, there are tactical traits, um, there are talent traits for those that like characters that uh, deal with magic and dancing and music and um, quick talking. So there are traits for talent skill 
um, that you can use. Uh, and also you can use linguistics to, to learn and, um, and pick up languages as well. So there are multiple ways to learn things in real time that don't require having to wait to level up to get them. Um, you can choose a character when you play this game that once you get your first organization from the start of the game, you never have to choose another organization, ever. You can just spend all your points and your skills because maybe you're somebody that goes around and just steals traits and or learns them from a place uh, within, the, within the game that the storytellers allowed you to go to or as put into the game for you to unlock. So leveling your character or being a trope of a, well, we only do spells for wizards and we're not really paying too much attention to fighters. Fighters just beat on things. Mm -hmm. In this game, the traits all allow you to do more. So you might have a particular weapon that you like and have a trait that allows you to do something special with that weapon that now grants you a bonus as well, similarly to the way a spell would work. So we've tried to balance that as best we can. Is there a lot of magic stuff? Of course, there's a ton of magic stuff. However, there's still, I think, 70 or so combat traits that are in here right now. Um, and, and the talent traits and all these other, other like passive style traits that you can get. Yeah. Now, with with that kind of thing in mind, whenever you whenever you're dealing with um with any sort with any sort of tech punk approach where you, where um where different degrees of technology are are um are intertwined or even, um you end up you end up with the situation of how how do you balance um yeah. the pre the prevalence of the prevalence of firearms or the rising prevalence with um Me with melee weapons since as Shadowrun Returns ended up teaching people the hard way um hmm. it's very easy to it's very easy to make um firearms too useful and then there then there's the question of why the hell should I pick a melee weapon if, without without it feeling like a trap a la swimming in Deus Ex <laughs> yeah so this is where I really broke away from what I've done before in Chromor. Um, you know, it's almost, it's almost like, um, you know, I, I love the Chromor universe. I, I write in it. I have a novel written in it. And I have another, another uh, sequel to that novel coming out in it um, or that I'm, that I'm working on right now, I should say, because uh, the first novel is released next year. Um, the, the universe is so interesting and has all of these different dynamics. And with the Dark Veil vale setting, uh, the reboot here of Dark Veil vale being the, this new new environment to play in yes of course i'm going to walk from a sector that has plasma guns to a sector that has um crossbows and and swords how does that balance mm -hmm. that was a big issue really early on in the in the mechanics and trying to figure out what to use should it be a numerical value where i'm adding and subtracting or should it be a success-based value one of the reasons success-based value was more appropriate was because we could then make it about the player's ability to wield that weapon, not the damage that that weapon dealt. So a weapon might have um, every weapon at zero. So gear has different uh, tier ratings. So uh, um, it might rating, we call a gear rating uh, zero to five. So a gear, a gear rating of zero for a sword is going to grant you a plus one bonus success to wield that sword. A gear rating zero for a plasma weapon is going to give you a plus zero uh, i'm sorry a plus one bonus success for that zero gear rating so they're equal in that sense however the plasma weapon may have an additional trait attached to it that says that it's going to uh deal a burn condition on the player if it hits their life points so if it hits past your defense and happens to start doing damage to your life points you have to make a quick resistance or a one action dice roll for your resistance skill and you need to uh, roll at least two successes or you're going to have this burn condition where your character is now dealing with suffering from that additional issue but now that sword may have a bleed or a rend condition also applied to it and keep in mind adding burn or adding bleed to this would crank up that gear rating it might require a gear rating three to add that sort of condition to it so now you're talking about well this gear is better and doing a special condition to the target and that is now going to balance this because conditions are the thing that's really painful for players and for enemies mm -hmm. not the weapon itself so your skill value with it and the value of that gear is going to apply that difference in the um, the the time period of different types of weapons. 
Now, also keep in mind, um, there's no movement mm -hmm. uh, technically in this game. You do not need a game board to play this. You can play it theater of the mind. Mm. And that's one of the great things about, and this is almost kind of a, a uh, it's not a great thing. COVID's terrible. But one of the benefits that have come out of this is realizing that people had to play this over Discord or people had to play this. Um, I didn't want to have to build a roll 20 every time we did a game. You don't need to. I wanted this to be simple. I wanted this game to be super approachable to anyone. And you don't have to do a ton of work as the storyteller when you remove that game board from it. So removing movement then adds all these other obstacles. Of, well, how do I know when I'm close to the target? How do I know if I am engaged in melee with that target? Well, we've removed rounds in the sense that uh, it's not every single player has a different initiative. The team of players has an initiative and they go as a group. So when an initiative is rolled, it's a quick uh, tactic skill dice roll. So everybody rolls and whoever gets the highest represents the group's ability to react in that combat when a conflict starts. And the enemies also do the same thing. And there can be group enemies or solo enemies. And so it's very easy for the storyteller to control an entire mob as one enemy group. And so the players all make their uh, three action turns on their group's turn, and then the enemy whatever, if there are however many groups there are in solo enemies, make their turns. And then it goes back and forth. So if I wanted to, say, get into height advantage, maybe I have a trait that says, if I am at an advantage of height on my enemies, I can do something extra and maybe cause an additional condition or get more bonus successes. So I'm going to take my character and use fitness to maybe climb to that higher height. Or I'm going to use tactics to, with my trait that I have, to try to uh, get around a target and find a weak spot on them so I can deal more damage with my rapier. Mm -hmm. Those traits are now going to inform the way that you perform combat. There is no, I take a five foot step away and that invokes a attack of opportunity. That is gone from this game. That doesn't exist because it's not part of the storytelling. So what we've done is we've created more of a story and an epic scene. Um, and I'm big, I used to work in the film industry and I'm big into theatrical film style epic fights and, and stunt combat, obviously. I've, on a bunch of martial arts and stunt combat and jujitsu. That's more where the fight is taking place of these back and forths. So it's the player's three actions that could represent multiple different skills being performed in their turn mm -hmm. back and forth. And so the balance going all the way back to the balance of these weapons, it's now about how the player is utilizing those weapons and the traits they have that are applied to them or that their character has the knowledge to, to use them. And they still need to roll successes on those dice rolls. They might completely critically fail out. I'm using my spear to stab at the enemy, and I have a trait that allows me to... It's not a reach weapon, but it allows me to do something that maybe pins my enemy back against the surface. And maybe they now have a, um, a pinning condition related to them where it feels like they they need to get out of it like some sort of uh, grapple, if you will. And so they may have to roll a fitness to... Um, gain enough successes to avoid or pull themselves off of that pin. Um, so there are, there are just different ways that we look at combat as opposed to the, I hit you, you hit me, I take a five foot step, you swing, you get a free hit, I cleave everything around me. Those aren't part of the mechanic in this, in this universe. Um, so we don't have to worry about it. And that, and that's how we've dealt with magic swords guns all battling back and forth in the same time and they just make sense because that's the way the universe has mm -hmm. delivered them yeah now with with that in mind um mm -hmm. i do i do want to i do want to get i do want to give my give give you my props for um how, for how well it's for <clears throat> for the for for um the for the launch of for the launch of the matter um how how what what are you shooting for as far as a page count? Yeah, I, I really like um, I, print print counts usually go by pages of eight. Mm -hmm. So when you're looking at like 300 pages and you go, oh well, I want to add a couple more, you go, okay, well that's 308. Okay, well now we're at 316. Now we're yeah. So I like 352. It's it's just a good number. Um, print costs are extremely high right now mm -hmm. in everywhere. Uh, Shipping, I don't need, we don't need to get into shipping and supply conversation, but supplies are insane all over the place. And we're, we're shooting for in the three to 352 range, we already have enough content to fill 400 plus pages. Uh, we're holding some of that content for future 
books just because we know it's it's probably going to fit better in those books and mm -hmm. to be able to create a product that people can buy and afford at a, at a reasonable rate 352 is probably the probably the target number um so it'll be in that range so you know i don't want to say 352 exact and we, we don't hit it and somebody says oh you said 352 but mm -hmm. We're looking at that 300 to 400 range, um, and it's going to be a multiple of eight because that's how you print, uh, not including the cover. Um, but uh, but yeah, in that in that ballpark uh, is what we're, is where we're going, and a lot of this is lore. So keep in mind, every organization has like paragraphs upon paragraph of lore content to build up that organization for the players' knowledge, and all the organizations themselves have additional uh, lore information. All of our factions have thousands of work uh, of of information. Our ancestries have content. And beyond that, the, the game is very easy mechanically. Um, and once you get into the traits, there's tons of traits. I mean, there's there's plenty of content in this book. Mm -hmm. And with the, with that in mind, I'll certainly be looking forward to how it how it develops. Um, mm -hmm. well, with, but with all that said, I would like to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come on to, to come onto the show and enjoy the madness at play here. Hmm. Yeah, no, it's it's fun. Uh, thanks so much for having me. It's it's great to talk about it and to talk to somebody who really understands gaming and and it's gonna it's going to I don't want to say challenge, but like uh, get into the weeds a little bit about that. Well, like why why do we choose these things? What why does it exist this way? Like what what's the reasoning behind it? I love that kind of questioning. Mm -hmm. And anytime you see fit to return, which I have a feeling will ha I have a feeling will happen in the future. Call it a hunch. Um, the door is always open. As I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. Hmm. Thanks so much. And of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the... Good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty everybody! <laughs>